everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by my friends over at a company called Real Mushrooms, realmushrooms.com. Um, Sky Chilton and his father, Jeff Chilton. I interviewed Jeff a number of episodes ago. Uh, really interesting guys. I, I really enjoyed that conversation with Jeff. Um, and it's a company that sells and distributes medicinal mushrooms in powder or capsule form. Um, I was really happy to have these guys come on. Uh, I think they were very much in alignment with the the values of the podcast. Uh, As you all know, a big part of this podcast is uh, about uh, plant medicine, holistic medicine. And I I think the benefits of medicinal mushrooms are are truly fantastic. And I think there's really a growing body of work uh, that's really showing and alluding to all of the amazing properties that mushrooms have. Um, They sell a lot of different mushrooms, um, things you've probably heard of like reishi, chaga, lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps. Um, those are all mushrooms I work with. They, they're, they're part of uh, what I consider uh, for myself a, a really holistic uh, supplement regime. Um, and the, the thing I really love about their company, not only are they really good guys, I think they're really ethical guys, um, but um, the, the product is really amazing. It's all uh, 100% mushrooms. They're organic. Uh, and, and that's really rare. For better or for worse, the supplement in this industry is, is highly unregulated. Um, and so often when you get supplements, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. You may be getting some mushroom. You may be getting a bunch of fillers and other things. Oftentimes, even when you're buying what may be a mushroom. It may not have any of that mushroom in it at all, unfortunately. Uh, Even some of the big, uh, I think even the biggest company that that sells mushrooms, actually it's not the fruiting body, not the mushroom itself. It's the mycelial, which is grown on grain, and then those things are mixed up and then sold in a supplement form. So not only are you not getting the mushroom itself, you're getting the mycelium uh, mixed with grain. So um, it's one of the amazing things of real mushrooms is it's exactly that. It's real mushrooms. So it's 100% mushrooms, organic. So you know you're getting a really good uh, product. You're getting the actual fruiting body, the, the mushroom itself, 100% of that. Um, and again, just really great guys. I'm, I'm really happy to have them on and supporting this podcast. Uh, so if you'd like a really good product, uh, you'd like to start working with medicinal mushrooms, um, check out their site, realmushrooms.com. Um, and also listeners of the show. Uh, if you go to their site, realmushrooms.com forward slash universe, you get 25% off your first order, uh, which is a really good deal. And I think once you uh, uh, start working and, and tasting their products, you'll you'll really uh, see and feel a big difference. So uh, thank you to them. And uh, I think that's it. And without further ado, here is the intro to the show. Hey, everybody. On this episode of the show, I sat down with my friend Jeanette Jeremillo. Uh, Jeanette and I met uh, many years ago, I think over a decade ago, when we were working together at the Ayahuasca Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. Um, Jeanette became a, a very dear friend. She, at the time, was heading the permaculture program there, uh, working with planting, sustainable forestry, agriculture, um, a, a lot of really interesting things. Uh, and that also really started her on her journey of working with plants and, and medicinal plants, things like ayahuasca, wachuma. So we sat down and uh, had a really inf- interesting conversation. It was a long time coming. Um, different reasons we didn't meet up, Uh, but she was someone I I wanted to have on the podcast for a long time, so it was really a a pleasure to sit down and connect with her. Uh, We we talked about things like permaculture, her background, ayahuasca, uh, her work with Huachuma or San Pedro, and a big part of this podcast was kind of the intersection between her Buddhist practices Uh, and these plant medicine practices. So uh, it was a really interesting conversation. I hope you all get a lot from it. Um, And and I think that's it. Uh, Also, if you're interested in working with plants and going deeper into plant medicine, uh, working in dieta, um, hopefully when this is released, uh, there will 
Actually, this will be released right before our Portugal retreat, uh, which we still have a couple spaces left. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org. Uh, I'll be there with my colleague, Marav Artsy. It's a really beautiful opportunity to go deeper into the world of plant medicine. Um, you can find more information on my website and also Marav's website. I'll, I'll put the links to both of those in the show notes. Um, and then, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. It's a website, patreon.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, and that's a really beautiful way, if you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, to give back. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, to all the people supporting that way, as always, uh, thank you very much for your help. I, I really uh, appreciate it, and it's really what allows me to continue making these episodes. Uh, if you're not able to do that, uh, always doing some of the really small things to help with the algorithm. So if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble, uh, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, leaving any questions or comments in the comment section. Uh, and then with the audio versions, Apple Podcasts and Spotify are, are the big ones and uh, leaving a starred rating and a short review. So I think that's it. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Jeanette. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. So yeah, I I met you. It seems like almost another lifetime now. It was I don't know maybe twelve years ago now. Um, yeah. I think two thousand thirteen at the Temple of the Way of Light. Yeah, two thousand thirteen when we were living in the jungle. I could um, remember exactly the houses, the heat, mm -hmm. your classes, your meditation classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was totally a, another lifetime. Are we yeah. recording? Yeah, yeah, we're recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe maybe to start, just uh, if you can give a bit about your background, because um, you have an interesting background and kind of where you're from, what, what brought you here to Peru, what brought you to the jungle, what got you interested in, in working with, with plants, with medicinal plants, with ayahuasca, wachuma, Buddhism, just, uh, I know it's always a big question, but maybe just to familiarize the audience a little bit with your background. Okay, so um, I'm from Ecuador, and I was raised in Ecuador until I was 24. And uh, when I was uh, at that age, I just, I was, didn't fit. It was like too many rules, uh, a lot of... Uh, different ways of treating female at uh, that time. And I was wild, so I always had these big problems with my dad and my mom was crazy. So at some point, um, I was studying business. I, I studied business for many years, but my soul wasn't there. And I was told I have to do this, and that is what is going to be a good thing for my life, like a businesswoman successful um, in this uh, life. This is what would bring you happiness. But I wasn't happy. And I was studying in the, kind of like the best university in Ecuador and one of the best in Latin America in this like business program. And I would cry. I would like, no, <laughs> it was not my soul. And at some point, like my, because there was this um, cut between what I really wanted and what I was doing and I, what I was told that was good for me, uh, I started having a lot of troubles because I was, at the same time, I was, I was like literally a punk in the streets and a business person at one time. And at the same time, at nights, I will be like hanging out with all these punk people. And, <laughs> and it was just very schism. And I started doing uh, a lot of alcohol. I was mistreating myself. And it got to a point that I, that it wasn't good. So I decided to leave. 
And for some reason, karma was always bringing me to New York. I was in New York several times before, and I had friends. And I talked to one of my dear friends, and he told me, just come to New York. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And he told me, just come to New York. And I left when I was 20, uh, five, 24 with $200. And I went to my friend's place, and uh, since then it was like a life in which I was taking care of myself. It was, I was the only person, the only woman of my whole family, big family, uh, extended family that ever left as a woman. Uh, I was the only person that at that age wasn't married and following the path. I was just completely different. So I went to New York and, and ended up doing business. <laughs> <laughs> because that was my training. So I ended up for like um, many years uh, doing marketing and business. And it was great at the beginning because I got money, I got friends, I was young, I was partying, I was taking care of my life. And at the same time, I was very interested in um, meditation, but very interested in yoga, very interested in cultivating the body and the mind, which is something that in Ecuador... We didn't really have uh, availability of these uh, techniques, these teachings. And uh, after a few years of uh, being in New York, and the first year was really hard, the third, fourth year, really cool, there was this void that I was feeling. Um, I started like, growing and growing, the same void that I was feeling when I was in Ecuador, to the point that um, I quit my job which was so hard to do because I had a really good job. They loved me, really well paid, interesting. And uh, it was a time where uh, the whole world, this U.S., was in um, a recession. So I was the only of my friends that had a stable job. So it took me a lot of time to, again, say, like, this is not where it goes. So this was like 2008, something like that? 2000, I left 2010. Okay. When every, everything was collapsing, I was doing really good. And I left because there was this uh, big calling telling me this is not the life I want to follow. And uh, because I was in New York, it's like full-on buildings, uh, you know, New York. This lack of nature, this lack of connection to nature start arising in my consciousness. One of uh, the very vivid dreams that I had at the time that was like, wake up, call. It was like me walking in the streets of New York, like, uh, you know, big street New York. I used to work in Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street, so giant buildings. And I was walking, walking in these giant buildings, and all of a sudden I made a turn, and I found myself in a dirt road just like this. And I was like, wow, I'm in this dirt road, and there is mountains just like this, and there's chickens running around. And uh, this longing for being in more of a rural environment and more of like nature started really arising. So at the same time that I was in the business the last year, I started um, taking classes on... uh, I was like crazy about the plants, taking classes. I work in a volunteer in uh, botanical gardens and I was uh, taking all these botanic classes and soil management and I took permaculture class and uh, my whole, I have this perfect perfect career it was going to end in my business life, I was studying environmental science the last year of my stay in New York and I was going to do this permaculture internship in Peru for four months, and then I was going to come back to New York uh, finished the um, environmental program and uh, I had it also planned, you know, finish my work, okay, this is going to be doing this, 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 everything is going to be so planned. And uh, yeah, I, I thought I had it really well planned when I left <laughs> uh, my business time. And uh, I came to Peru just for four months. Actually, I came to Peru to do an uh, internship in permaculture. And uh, the thing is that it was so well planned. Times, I'm really good at planning things. So everything was so well planned. As soon as I arrived to Peru, 
the bus, the taxi that was going to pick me up to take me to the hotel never arrived. So I didn't know where I was. I had to find another hotel. And since that, the minute to, I arrived to Peru, supposed to be staying for four months, everything just changed. And this, uh, <laughs> this life started flowing. And because I just completely opened to the flow of life, um, many things many things that it seems like a miracle, like uh, the flow started calling me. And one of them is, um, uh, I was coming to Peru to do this internship in permaculture. And uh, the place back then was called Planet People Passion. But it was these two organizations, Paititi, which mm-hmm. is an uh, organization that work with plant medicine, with Roman here in Peru. And this Planet People Passion organization with Cynthia, with his, uh, you know, romance partners, uh, people that work with ayahuasca here. So I met Cynthia in New York. I was the volunteer, the first volunteer they had for permaculture ever when they were in uh, in uh, in Iquitos, in the jungle of Iquitos. And... Uh, hmm... <laughs> I didn't realize, or I didn't put my attention, mass attention, that this project was like half ayahuasca retreats and plant medicine and half permaculture. I didn't really care as much, actually, about the plant medicine part. I was like, I'm going to put my hands in the dirt. I want to plant the plants. And when I came to Iquitos, they were doing the last of... uh, filming this uh, documentary called Sacred Science. And most of the crew have left, but there were still a few patients, like full-on people with a lot of uh, difficult medical conditions, cancer, crown disease. And there was a few people helping and supporting the patients, but not as many people. So as soon as I arrived, I think like for the first month, there was no permaculture for me. <laughs> it just put me straight, it put literally straight to do three ayahuasca ceremonies. I was like, what is this? <laughs> and after that, uh, to help people um, that were the patients and to support them, to feed them, to help them wash and clean. And that experience was... Uh, very important in my life. I I think the ceremonies itself were not mm, as impactful for me, but what was impactful was the people and seeing how the people were healing, how the people were connecting to different parts of themselves. They were accepting, they were sick, they were accepting that. Because I was there for, I think I was there for over two months and uh, talking regularly uh, with all these friends, they became friends, and uh, talking about their lives, talking about what it meant for them to be in the jungle, drinking medicine, a completely different environment. Um, For me, the jungle was more familiar because in Ecuador we have jungle, and I always liked the idea of living in the jungle, actually. That's why I went to Peru. Um... And it taught me about people's resilience. And it told me also that this medicine, uh, there is something there. There is something in this medicine. There is something in these uh, traditions. There is something that I had no clue. And uh, from that point on, life just started like happening. Somehow, I fell in love. <laughs> I met a partner. And we were gonna go to Europe, but uh, and then to New York, and then somehow I got a hire to support in the permaculture program program of the Temple of the Way of Light. And it was like this: I didn't even ask a person, knew a person they needed, and I ended up uh, living at the Temple of the Way of Light for three years, on and off, mostly uh, working a lot with the 
permaculture program at the beginning when you weren't there, helping uh, establish that program, supporting uh, the young people, mostly young people, that would come to do this um, kind of like half internship with the permaculture, half uh, ayahuasca uh, retreat. So they will come for two weeks and drink, and then after two weeks, they will work in the permaculture plants. And um, that experience just really changed my life, uh, understanding more about plant medicine and also, wow, and also learning about uh, environmental practices and uh, learning about a world that I didn't even imagine existed because uh, the way I, I was raised, my dad is a doctor, my mom is a teacher, nobody ever goes out of the path of this is what you do, you go to university, you get married, this is how you live. And uh, when I was exposed to other people's lives and many different stories of how to live a life more freely, I was totally in... Well, this is like half, I'm sorry, it's like a long, long, long story. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. When you when you were at Paititi, and just a side note is uh, also I, I interviewed uh, Roland on this podcast, so if people are interested in that, they can, oh, they can listen to him. He's a really amazing guy. Um, was that your first time working with kind of like a a stronger or, or you know, however you want to call these, like a master plant like ayahuasca? Was, was that the first time you had experienced something like that? Yeah, first time. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't drawn to cannabis. Uh, there was a lot of alcohol in Ecuador, but never. Um, yeah, I haven't experienced something different. However, actually, I had mushrooms once mm-hmm. or twice, and that was incredible. And I knew about. Um, <laughs> that's so funny. Now I remember, like, wow, no, actually, <laughs> I knew about uh, Huachuma, San Pedro, because Ecuador is one of the places uh, where San Pedro is, and we knew this plant is special. It's actually grown outside the houses in many places in the city just to protect the house. And I also knew about Toe, never touch it. Uh, I did touch it, though. <laughs> no, good idea. <laughs> I imagine that must have been interesting too, because kind of as you were describing the the patients and and the work they were doing that was documented in that film, Sacred Science. I imagine it must have been interesting because I think often when we think of healing, we think more on the physical level. Like, is, is someone being healed? Meaning, is are their symptoms going away? But also, as you're describing that, there, there was something in the way that you were saying it that maybe the people were also experiencing physical healing, but that there was something else that was going on. Like uh, you said, they were having to confront that they actually and accept that they were sick and, and what that means and, and uh, coming to terms with, with their life, with death. Did, did that begin to shift your, your perspective in some way as to what, what these plants were doing or, or ways in which they were working that were maybe not purely on the physical level? Absolutely. I, I could see that at a physical level, some people were getting healed, but other people were... It was supporting, but the, the, the disease was so advanced that... Um, yeah could have been really hard if one of them died, uh, a woman with cancer, Melinda. And I used to talk to a lot of, with her. And uh, what I would hear from her is that the opportunity of connecting to spirit, the opportunity to know that there is a beyond this reality and uh, to connect to their wounds from the past, connect to their relationships from the past and heal those relationships. That was even more important than the healing of the body because that allowed her to be in peace with life. And when you're in peace with life, you also can be in peace with the process of death. There is no separation. 
and uh, there was this, I, I, I hope I can remember the name. There was a little book that I read before my first ceremony at, Pai, at Paititi. Uh, I don't remember the name, but the whole thing theme in the book is that uh, the people that were around you, your parents, your friends, they did the best they could with the information they had. And um, because the information that I read in the book, just a tiny little book, and then the ceremony and then talking about um, their healing with people, I realized that it was way beyond physical healing. It was the the healing of uh, different aspects of our being, the emotions that have been trapped, the emotions that were not allowed to be felt, the mental healing, the energetic healing. And, uh, yeah, and for some reason, even though that was, that was new for me, there was something in me that wasn't fully surprised of it, that was like, oh, because there is integrity, there is not... We are not separate. There is a um, manifestation of sickness in the body that comes from uh, traumas, that comes from what happened to us in our lifetime or to our parents or to our ancestors or to our society. So I had that notion already, but um, I think like seeing it from people kind of confirm and... Uh, I remember Melinda, she she caused a big impression on me. Um, she was so happy, she, and she said, if I die, I will die happy, because look at me, I get to be in the jungle. And uh, at that time, that disconnection between uh, us humans and nature, that was so, so present for me, because that, is what, that was my reality in New York. Actually, I wasn't even tapping into my own past and healing all trauma wounds. It was this disconnection between the natural world and us as being part and belonging to this world that felt uh, very present to me at that time. So when she was like in the middle of nowhere, in this hut, super happy, being in peace because she got to live in the jungle, looking at the stars. Yeah, there is something that was so impactful for me. I think that was the the beginning of uh, of my healing, but it came through this door of disconnection to nature. So you you were really interested in, as you said, getting your hands in the soil, getting them dirty, planting plants. Um, can you can you speak a bit about permaculture? I think a lot of people are maybe familiar with that word, and but I, I would imagine a lot of people aren't too. And maybe just what is permaculture? The ideas behind it? What it's what it's trying to to do? Yeah, so it just feels like a lifetime ago. Like permaculture in my life is like <laughs> not as present as it used to be, but uh, at some point it was very important, and it's um. This system of uh, thinking, of uh, seeing the world instead of as a compartmentalized, it's like a holistic living organism. Where um, and this is how indigenous people think, and they taught for many years. And uh, well, the system of permaculture was um, established by an uh, Australian man named Bill Morrison, but based on indigenous practices based on this very earthy understanding of how life works. So the idea is that we think in terms of systems, not like isolated unit that the soil is this, and the, yeah, this is my plot of land, and this is separated by the wall, and that's it. No, we think about that everything is energy flowing and moving, and the sun coming from this part illuminate this side of the land, and the wind has this uh, flow that we can observe and see how um, how we can use this energy, how the water is um, is flowing. So it's like a very beautiful way of uh, connecting to earth and connecting to all the elements and creating uh, a space that could be. 
um, used by humans, we create it because we want to live in it, that uh, connects, that it has no separations between the elements and uh, what we want to achieve. We collect the rain, we make houses with the same uh, mud in the house, in the, in the dirt, there is different zone systems, like the first zone that is close to the house is like where you get your veggies and your herbs, the ones that are closer. And it's just really beautiful a uh, way of uh, living consciously and living in accordance to the environment, not block. And we can see it here in Peru, like uh, my house is made out of the same mud bricks from the land and the same eucalyptus from the land. and. Uh, the rocks we use. My husband is super into uh, planting so he, and making big rock walls, so he makes all these rock walls everywhere. <laughs> so there is, a, yeah, that connection to nature and that living in nature, not separate. Mm-hmm. So you, <clears throat> you were at Paititi, uh, and, and then you accepted this job at the Temple of the Way of Light, leading the permaculture program. What was that like? What was that like being in a in a new environment? I mean, maybe still somewhat familiar, but but also a new environment. You're you're living in the Peruvian Amazon, um, and as you said, it was it, it was at the Temple of the Way of Light, which, if people aren't familiar, is a is a big um, plant medicine ayahuasca center, uh, really specializing in ayahuasca, also in the in the lineage of a group of people called the Shipibo people. So what was that like? Because your your job is working in this like integrated system of permaculture of the land, uh, being connected to the jungle, also kind of facilitating all of these people coming from the outside, usually people coming from other countries, from other cultures, into this different environment, learning to work with their hands, learning to work with plants. And at the same time, as you said, that was half of it. And then the other half is... They're also going into these quite deep internal processes of, of, of drinking ayahuasca, of working in this lineage of, of, of the Shipibo. And uh, I would imagine like that, that brings up a lot. I mean, it, it's really also shifting your worldview, like, you know, because these things are also very connected. Like, like as you said, we often compartmentalize things. Like we look at ayahuasca as as not a plant even like, yeah. even though we know it's a plant yeah. we, we don't necessarily like realize it comes from a place it comes from a soil it comes from a location it comes from a culture i mean i do a lot of work with tobacco and i would say the vast majority of people when they think about tobacco they don't think of a green plant with pink flowers they think of something else so there's there's also kind of a, a disconnect in in these things yeah wow you just i'm gonna have a little bit of drink mm-hmm. okay. Okay. It just uh, remind me to one of the first uh, things that happened when I was uh, the first like week that I was at the temple. There was a group of volunteers. I was the first. They didn't have a boss before. There was nobody in the permaculture program, so they were raking leaves for days at the time. <laughs> so I came there and I was the boss. And I asked one of the persons to water the plants. So we plant these plants. And I was like, okay, you are closer, you are there. I have to take care of this other group of volunteers because it was like two months for two weeks. This group of volunteers will be drinking and this other group will be working in permaculture. Then the other, um, you know, it will change. So I asked this person to just water the plants that they planted, and it was some beautiful herb or something. And the person didn't want to do it because it was not in his or her uh, turn of working. And I was like, wow, how can you drink this medicine and be doing this and also having these other plants and not taking care of them? And that was a... That this strike me, and I just remember this now. Uh, it was a beautiful program. Perhaps it wasn't the most effective program because people, many people will come with uh, the desire 
or the main interest of drinking ayahuasca, and having zero experience in permaculture. So that was that type of group, and there will be another uh, group of people that will come for genuine uh, connection, trying to get a connection with nature. And uh, the jungle is a very difficult environment. It's hard, it's hot, it's humid, it's very different from what people in the north are used to. And uh, I think, like, for many people, was really struggling after working for so many hours. I mean, like, after drinking medicine and just going into this so intimate process and just, like, fasting. Sometimes they have to do this, like, fast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of the facilitators will encourage them to uh, rise, run, rise fast for 14 days, and they will be like this and then come to me, and I will be like, okay, guys, let's shovel, let's plant, let's, let's do this. And uh, well, <laughs> with what comes with the physical strain of being there. But uh, for me, uh, it was um, a beautiful gift to be able to connect people to nature, people that have, and myself, you know, because it, it's not that I have much experience, I always was born in a city, but uh, this opportunity to teach people how to plant, to say, you know, touch the seeds, to yeah, help people how to be in nature was really beautiful. Yeah, however, there was that disconnection of I come, I dream, these people serve me, uh, these plants are not even plants, this is just. Uh, this juice that takes me to out the space uh, out of a different realms and this disconnection to uh, earth was not easily accessible for everybody some people yes but other people many people it was tough to connect to nature it was tough to be um, at least at the beginning it was a three month program it was tough to be in the environment but I'm so sorry. <coughs> I did like at the at the beginning could be challenging to just leave. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have showers, running water. We have bucket showers. We didn't have like regular toilets. It was compost toilets. So at the beginning myself and I see the struggle in many uh, for this different way of living but after a while it just felt so nurturing not having electricity going to bed early being with candles not having phones looking at the stars and the body just becomes in alignment with uh, with nature I miss it <laughs> I, I, I wish I could not live with electricity but I can't but um, yeah, there is something uh, primal that awakens when people drop into the rhythms of nature and when they are drinking medicine. It's just so beautiful and challenging, but uh, it's, it's ultimately very rewarding and very beautiful to go back to simplicity, living in these little huts, tiny bed, and being happy, living in community, lots of dramas, but finding our ways to solve. Uh, yeah, I feel like it was one of the most enriching uh, times of my life, one of the most hardest times of my life as well. As a, I used to have a lot of freedom when I was in New York. got my own money, I knew where I was going, I had so much freedom. I choose everything, but uh, when living in community, uh, especially in the way that community was at the time, there was hierarchical, there was jobs, it was just recreating uh, what we have outside. At the time, I don't know how it is now, but that was uh, that was challenging for me, that was the most challenging for me, actually. And I think uh, we are trying to remember ways of living. We are trying to re or create or remember ways of being healthier, because the way that we are 
living, our ways of living, especially in big cities, is unhealthy. And uh, all what we see is the reflection of that uh, unhealthiness, uh, problems in our society, crime, uh, problems, mental problems, physical problems, all that reflects the way that uh, as a collective, this we are not actually living as we should be living. We've, we are it's out of balance. So I appreciate so much places that want to create a different way or remember a different way of living as uh, hard as it is and it's always very beautiful. You said that, you know, with, with all of the beauty and, and, and the struggle and everything, but, but one thing you said is that it felt like they were trying to recreate a, a system that was mimicked from the outside, like a kind of a, a hierarchical system where people had different jobs and, and authorities, hierarchies. Is there something looking back or something you've learned since then that, that leads you to, to think that there's, there's a better way to do it that's based on, a, on another way of doing things? For sure. I actually, uh, when I went to Peru from New York, this, I had this seed planted in uh, um, intentional communities. I, w I don't know where I hear and that, and in the permaculture program, we talk about intentional communities, living in community. And my idea was to check how that happens. So I went to the Petiti, I went to the temple, and I actually saw a few other communities. And I talked to the permaculture teachers and people that did the programs in, uh, uh, yeah, in the U.S. And they were telling me that the hardest part is not the design, is not the planting, is not the environmental part. The hardest part is the relationships and how the structure is called social permaculture, how the how people relate to one another. Kanda is uh, where we get entangled with our egos, with our I am right, you are not right. And um, yeah, that is the hardest part. And I have seen this in uh, other um, spiritual institutions that I've been part of that also recreates. I'm the boss, I get this much amount, my say is more important, you are here, Okay, you have this much to say, you, ha you earn this much, mm. I take this much of decisions, you take this much of decisions, this person here doesn't take many decisions. And um, I feel like I'm in a place of observing. I have observed a lot of that, and I have actually, I'm uh, creating an uh, organization I, uh, uh, with retreats. And the way that my organization works, which is, is completely transparent. All, uh, we are four people working there. We, uh, every single thing related to money, because that tends to be money, power, <laughs> tends to be um, the areas as humans. We, we don't know how to, yeah, we are learning how to be better in these areas. So like in my organization, everything is transparent all the numbers are transparent and we choose, okay, how much, okay, you work this, how much you want to get paid in between the whole organization and decision-making process is um, not hierarchical. It's more like one-on-one, -on -one, which works for um, when there is four or five people in an organization. I think like it would be harder that um, with more people However, I feel like there, is, there has to be a way, especially in business, to bring equality because we have, we see it, like 1% has everything and people working so much have very little access to resources. So I, I believe that um, because that is the system that we have uh, been living for, yeah, since monarchy, who knows? <laughs> Uh, for how long um, we tend to recreate it but there is other ways and it has to be we have to ask ourselves these questions because it's not working it's, we see it, it's not working it's not make anybody happy 
Do, do you think there, there there's a way of, of blending these two things? Uh, I mean, because it's something I think about a lot, but, you know, taking, for example, in the Amazon with, with these communities, which aren't necessarily intentional because they're also built upon really blood with, with relations. There, there are people, like the Shipibo identify as Shipibo, or the Tubu identify as Tubu, or the Ashaninka identify as Ashaninka. So they're born already into a certain society. But it's also very fascinating because, from my understanding, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, but they are much more egalitarian in that way. Um, you know, one, one of the things I, I remember being a kid, and I, I forget where I heard this, but I, I was always very fascinated by North Native American cultures. And one of the kind of the sicknesses they said of the white man was that they didn't understand how in those societies a man could tell another man what to do. And I always found that very fascinating. And I think it's something that also really inspired my life, because uh, you were talking about how we get kind of mariado, how we get dizzy under the, the influence of power. And I think it's yeah. something that, that a lot of us uh, struggle with. And, and, and that's something that, that I find very beautiful, is this idea that no one truly has power over us, because that is the hierarchy. When you say, like, I can tell you what to do, and I think people don't also really think deeply about what that means as, as a whole. Um, and, and so in a lot of these more traditional societies, there are these kind of egalitarian things where it's not, you know, even that idea of chief was something that was really kind of, I think, imposed by the outside. Like in these societies, it was more egalitarian. Everyone had their role and roles weren't necessarily seen as better or worse. There, there was the dancer, there was the, the peacemaker, there was the warrior, there was the, the healer, there was the, you know, this person, this person, but they all had their role. But also those roles, uh, people were born into them. Um, so do you see that there's a way where we can kind of bridge those things? Because in a lot of the societies, like we're not necessarily born into maybe a very strong, you know, especially more and more, we're not born into a very strong lineage of like, these are my people or this is my community. Uh, and one of the things we also really value is this idea of like individual freedom of well, I want to do this, or I want to do that, or I, much like you were saying, like I don't want to be in the role that I was given of marrying and uh, being a businesswoman or whatever. Like I want that freedom of, of like choosing my role. But that's all also not always the case in a lot of these indigenous societies. Like your role is given to you. It could be when you're born or who you're born to, or you know, there, there's a lot of factors to that. But do you see ways of, of kind of bridging those worlds? Because we also live very differently from a lot of these indigenous societies. And yet at the same time, as you're saying, like, and I think a lot of people feel this, they, 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 they're longing for something. They're longing for something that, that the societies they're living in are not uh, giving them or fulfilling that, that longing. I know that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see how I can respond to this. Like, I think in a way, we live differently, but we also create our own circles of belonging. Because at the end of the day, without belonging to a bigger group, we will die. That is, uh, we are gregarian creatures. We are born to be and uh, to be always uh, among the support of a tribe, being our co-workers, being our family, being our friends, being the tribe of a soccer player team that we like. Um, I, I don't remember where I read, but it was something like this. Um, the individual alone person is an illusion, is a myth. We uh, we are always in uh, communion, however, this idea that we can do it by ourselves alone, this is, that is a myth, that is, that's not real because we can't, it's always around, we are always living in society, so what, uh, what I feel as this, uh, as we are realizing, we go to this way, I feel like a I could put it like myself as an example. So 
growing up in this uh, society, very strong, you have to do this, very strong family all together, and then finding this individuality, it's like, no, I want to do it by myself, and then realizing that actually, uh, no, there is something in between, this uh, uh, reclaiming my identity or creating like really strong identity, understanding who I am, and from that place, coming into communion with other people and I think that could be seen also as <laughs> perhaps <laughs> as a way of like seeing our path let's say I, I read about this uh, like we came from these strong cultures and all of a sudden this part of us as human that this teenager path that wants to find this individuality who am I comes and lives like the hero journey and lives and we are kind of like in that part now as society I could see it uh, or I see it like that um, we went into this me individualistic money driven society and now there is like oh actually this is actually not really making me happy I want to go back into heal I want to go back into understanding my roots I want to go back and understanding my ancestors and creating a uh, a way of being and that can honor both, can honor the individual self and that can honor uh, this individual as part of a collective. Because if, if there is not a process of individualization, I think we miss this uh, deep connection to parts of ourselves that are unique. Uh, it, that's why I feel like many... Uh, try of like really put on in communist societies doesn't work either. And it is other individualistic, like separate societies doesn't really work. We are seeing it. So there is um, this process of individualization that happened until we find, uh, until we really connect deeply to who we are. And that requires a deep, deep introspection, deep like <laughs> closet to oneself, you know? And um, from that point, from that strain that comes from self-knowledge, then we can come out in society and share and feel, um, yeah, this, uh, this belonging. But this belonging starts with oneself. Right? I, I strongly believe that, that uh, we don't feel that we belong because there is a big uh, pull to find who we are outside. And it is, like it's both, it's here and it's out. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so then, what was that like? Um, because I, uh, I would imagine, you know, when when you're working there, uh, your your primary focus is on permaculture, on organizing on doing your own work on, on, on helping to organize other people uh, but you also began working with ayahuasca yeah. so what was can can you kind of describe what that process was like what um, because it was also I think kind of a, a new process of working with these sacred plants and um, kind of what you what you learned or what began to open or what got you interested then in, in continuing to, to do that kind of work I think it was hard for me, harder than for other people because I went there for permaculture. So many people would go knowing that they want to drink ayahuasca. They were like, this is it. I'm coming, flying, paying, leaving everything to come and commute with this medicine. But for me, it was like something that was given and was offered. And in a way, I was... I had to do it because I was like living there. So at the beginning, I I questioned it a lot. And I questioned, I remember people were talking about healing. And I was like, what the hell? I was coming from a um, very kind of like social activist path in my life, you know. I used to go to all these like protests and anti-war and like... Activist is always something I, I I I cherish. I actually cherish people that have this sense of uh, 
a kind of duty to the community. And I always find that uh, fascinating, like the archetype of the activist, the person that fights for justice was always fascinating to me. And when I come to the plant medicine, I will see these individuals just looking for healing themselves. And I couldn't understand it. I was like, how could you take the time to do this? Why don't you think about others? But then... Um, <laughs> It's funny, I, I was asked to do all this, all my first ceremony, I wasn't me, I want to do it. I was asked to do this retreat, these two retreats, it was like 14 ceremonies. And I really understand when people say, like, they have so much to heal, so much to heal. I didn't really understand what they were talking about, because I, apparently, I was bottling up all my things, I don't know. Focusing like we have to help others, and uh, when I start drinking medicine, it was like wow. <coughs> I'm sorry. I realized so much of my relationships with my fa family and how they were impactful for me. Relationships that I had when I was a teenager, like fifty years ago, and they had this still a play in my consciousness and it's still an impact in my present life and after that I realized that wow there was so much to heal <laughs> so much and uh, that okay I could have never been effective without a deep recognition of what was stopping my path or what was actually detrimental for myself I I think like I didn't fully look inside until I started drinking the medicine. I was forced to look inside and being in the environment of everybody's talking about healing. So that came uh, and brought this deep questioning on oh, what are the parts of me that are blocking my own growth? What is what are the wounds that I have and uh, can I look at them? So yeah, I feel like it was um, also like the com the connection with indigenous people, the living, the maestras, they were living at the temple, the maestros, uh, Shipibo people, and I was translating. I was actually, I at that time, I was the only Spanish-speaking person that wasn't in a position of serving, cleaning dishes and cooking. I was the only person that was bridging uh, kind of like these worlds because all the people that were working at the temple were foreigners and they were, all the people pretty much that come at the temple were foreigners from the US, Australia or, you know, Europe. It was no Latin American and that had an impact on me as well. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it was uh, very beautiful to be the bridge between these cultures and it's something that I actually kind of embrace as a path of my in my in my life. That that, that path of like uh, bridge keeping. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's beautiful. So you, you were saying already when you were in in in, in Quito, I, I guess in in Ecuador, um you became interested in things like meditation, maybe self-inquiry. Um, where did where did Buddhism come in? Because that's that's something you're you're now very interested in. And even when I when I met you, there there was a lot of interest and in wanting to learn more, work in those practices. How did that how did that come into your life? Actually, it was in New York when I was start getting interest in that, and uh, mainly yoga, and the yoga after the class, the meditation part of the yoga was always uh, cherished to me. Mm. When I left Ecuador, I had like, I was a mess. Like, oh, I was a big mess when I left Ecuador at 24. When I went to New York, like things became better in one way because I was stable. I, ha I was forced to be stable. Nobody takes care of me there. If I don't work and I don't put it together, I will be in the streets. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get better. And it, uh, a big part of this uh, 
moving of energies of this uh, dealing with um, anxiety, depression, full on, in a time where I had no money and there was no therapies or nobody would talk like now. That everybody has a therapist and there is this plant medicines and all these things. Somehow, like, um, I think it was intuition, just kept me pulling my myself into a embodiment. So I would do a lot of physical activity, a lot of, like, bike riding. I always say, like, biking saved my life. And then, like, um, I started doing yoga, but among other, like, physical, uh, physical somatic and embodiment practices that at the time like the spiritual part was a component but at the time it was like being in the body and like understanding how this connection of body mind was so so important and uh, like for me this um, physical activity uh, support my well-being and it was like and it is still like very important for me and uh, while living at, uh, and that because of the yoga, I got a little interested in meditation and uh, uh, other ways of being with the mind. But it wasn't until I went to um, the Temple of the Well of Light and there was some really interesting people there that I hear about this 10-day retreat, this Vipassana 10-day retreat that's supposed to be as hard or harder than an ayahuasca retreat. Back then I was like, okay, this is hard. And I like that. I always, I have this, and I always was drawn to mo a monastic life since I was a teenager. Even though I was wild, a part of me wanted to become a nun. And I tried, I, I did like a little nun retreat for a few days. And I part of me was attracted, always been attracted to this like, ascetic practice life and uh, um, after three years of living at the temple I left the temple um, of the way of light and uh, somehow I end up being hired by this woman who now is a lama, a Buddhist lama but back then she was working with the medicine at the temple as well and uh, she also was really into these Buddhist practices and as soon as uh, she hired me to organize a retreat, an ayahuasca retreat with her. Uh, but as soon I hear about these practices, there was such a pull. There was like, I have to do this. I have to uh, get involved in these practices. And uh, that was my reason for helping this woman, establishing and doing this retreat, because there is something that I wanted to learn, and I have no clue of how to start. You know... I, it's different when you come from, and it's different now. This is like 14 years ago, perhaps 10 years ago. In Peru, I'm a Latin person. These things were not in our awareness. It's not like when you are in Peru and you are born knowing that there is Catholicism and a range of practices and religions is different. So I didn't have a clue how to follow this path, but... I hear about this tender retreat, and I went to the tender retreat, and it was like, wow. I realized that um, all the work that I was doing with the medicine, I actually wasn't paying attention to my mind. I was actually believing every single thing that my mind was saying. <laughs> and then when I, when I went to the tender retreat, it's like, oh, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be believing all this. All this is not actually real and uh, this different understanding of how to be in the world and this different understanding of how to work with medicine just uh, start emerging from uh, vipassana practice which is my main practice and uh, yeah i think it's a great synergy of uh, being aware, being mindful, being present is always good in every single thing you do. So if plant medicine is always going to be good as well. So that is how it started. And from there, I've been blessed enough to have these two paths always um, interweaven in my life. I work work for an organization that emerged 
these two paths, the Buddha's teachings and um, plant medicine for many years, like eight years. And uh, this has been kind of like my main, uh, yeah, my main path. And there's so much to learn, you know, there's so much to learn in both paths. And what is what does Buddhism mean to you? A beautiful road of understanding what means to be human, what means to be alive, and what means to a means to having a happier and healthier life. A means to bring more love, more compassion to our relationships with oneself and with everything around us. A means to calm a little bit like uh, the suffering in the world, which is what the Buddha tried to do, like create through this deep uh, awareness, through his understanding in uh, in the times of enlightenment, he just saw how much pain there is in the world and how much of that pain is caused by our unawareness, from the unawareness of thought, the unawareness of our words, our actions. Uh, so yeah, for me it's that, it's like how to live better, how to live with compassion and care and heart, yeah. You you said a really interesting thing that that um, that I think many people when they begin working with plants or or other practices, uh, there's always this, this this kind of split or chasm, which is uh, you said like I was believing all of my thoughts when I was working with ayahuasca, and um, in general we believe most of our thoughts to be true. Um, have you have you seen or have you learned ways to to differentiate? Because certainly one of the things that ayahuasca or, or certain plants can do is to to teach us. That's why they're also called often teacher plants or, or master plants. Um, and how to differentiate that that knowledge that's that's coming from depending on our cosmovision, from the plant, from God, from spirit, from from our, our higher self. Uh, versus, as you were saying, like maybe things that are arising that I'm believing, but they may not be true. They may be coming from just my normal patterning or my my, my normal self or my ego, maybe as, as as some people may say. So, like what that differentiation is between what's true and and what's not true. I think a lot of have to do with a uh, not just focusing right here in the thought, but actually bring awareness to the physical sensations. And uh, in a ceremony, we could have this awesome, you know, fantasy world. And the body, like mind could be here, body completely disconnected. But what these practices point, and it's, uh, it's funny because like mindfulness things like so much focus on the mind, but however, the, the focus is actually coming out of here and bringing it, awareness into the whole body because there is um, so much wisdom so much information that is passing through our heart our body that is moving through our bodies so I am always trust more the wisdom of the body than the wisdom of the mind because every so Every second we are having like one thought and happy thought and sad thought. So um, in life and in uh, working with plant medicine, this uh, understanding, trying to go back into more of the wisdom of the heart and corroborate it with the mind becomes like a more reliable source of uh, of guidance, let's say. Yeah, I, and uh, time, I feel like there is many ideas that come when we are in the medicine, much, so much information that can happen. So you just got to observe it, just be with it, and uh, just pass it through the like kind of awareness of 
the pass it through time and see what happens. I always say that um, even though we have like this incredible information and many things like f- feel right uh, and they feel yeah important, let's wait a little bit to see what happens with life and uh, how how do we body my my main thing right now after working with so many years with plants and is actually how do we embody the teachings how do we actually live the life in the day by day the life that ayahuasca is pointing to us because i feel all these plants ayahuasca wachuma these uh, incredible beings these incredible spirits are teaching us how to be more harmonious, are teaching us harmony, how to be live in harmony with our past relationships, with our family, with our environment, with our thoughts, with our body. And uh, there is the marking that you're saying, like, this is it, you forgive this, you cry this, you let go of this, and perhaps, like, moving to this to-do list, always very common that when you have a ceremony you've got like okay I have to do this this and call this person um, and there is this like pull into wholeness that uh, the medicine is bringing to us but what happens after and I think like uh, actually I, I deviate from your question a little bit but uh, one of my ways of uh, knowing that is so higher source of wisdom that my own crazy mind is is this pointing into wholeness is this pointing into goodness is this pointing into connection is this what I'm receiving is creating more harmony or is inflating me and separating me from the others and creating this grandiose idea about myself grandiose idea probably your ego connection to others a Feelings of compassion, feelings of harmony, higher self. That idea of embodiment, um, I mean, I, I think uh, a lot with this plant work now, there's, there's this very more and more common idea of integration. But I think embodiment is, is another way of also expressing that same idea, which is just as you said, like, how do I embody that knowledge? How do I integrate it into my life? Um, because obviously like there's that knowledge can just exist as knowledge but then that's all it is it's just knowledge and, and so how do we bring it into our lives how do we embody it are there are, are there are there better ways from your experience of working with plants to allow us to 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 embody it or do you think there's specific practices that, that can or should be done in, in accompaniment with, with plant medicine to, to really begin to do that? Um, because I, I think even from a more indigenous perspective, like uh, like I, I always remember this one story, uh, because you know often at the temple, as you said, like there, uh, one of the roles that we filled was this bridge, uh, this 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 bridging of, of language, of translating from the Shipibo to to English, from Spanish to English, yeah, but also world visions, cosmovisions, ways of of, of, of being that bridge. And um, uh, you know, I, I remember this one example quite early on when when I was translating and. Uh, it was a guy from Mexico, so he spoke Spanish. So in, in a way, we didn't have to bridge. So he was speaking Spanish, and he was speaking about his, his first ceremony, and it was in the, the, the consultation. And he had this amazing first ceremony, and he was connecting with all these things, and he said, you know, I, I found my, my, my spirit animal, and I forget what it was, but he was so happy and proud. And, you know, and, but it was very much kind of this idea of me and what I found, and, you know, la pa, look at me. And, uh, you know, part of that, that translation is also kind of <laughs> sometimes uh, being a bit easy with, with how the Shipibo respond to that. But in that situation, we didn't because they spoke Spanish. So they, they kind of all looked at each other. And, uh, and, and one of the, the, the female maestras uh, just said to him, point blank, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll clean that out of you tomorrow. <laughs> 
and you could just see like this like oh, the caving in of like because he was expecting oh you know wow yeah, that's amazing you're, you're obviously chosen you have this amazing connection to the plant um, but it, my point of all of that was I, I think in a lot of these traditional cultures they're much more embodied they're much more grounded in that way uh, I think in a lot of this work, and and again, it's not inherently bad, but there's more of this fascination of of like the astral, of the going outside of our body, of of the mind, of of the fantasies as well, which are extremely valuable. They're also extremely important. Um, but sometimes with these plants, especially like a plant with ayahuasca, which it does take us to all of these different levels, um, there's not maybe as much of a focus on on embodiment of, of what does that actually mean? What does that mean in my life and my reality? Uh, and if we don't put that into this world, then, then I think in a way we're also not honoring the plant because the plant is asking us to to embody it because that's what we are. We're we're a body. So how does how do we embody the spirit of that plant? Um, so. Kind of a long question, but but do you find there there there's ways of working with these plants that that more naturally lead to that embodiment, or do you think there's there's other practices that we can do that can 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 really help with that? Oh, for sure. Um, I feel like this tendency, this tendency of leaving the body, this tendency of not being here. This is exactly, and I feel like I'm so grateful because I come from these lenses of uh, the Buddha's practice. Uh, it's like, get me out of there, and the Buddha is not. Actually, the true uh, awakening comes from true embodiment, true, like, incarnating fully in this life, in this body, as hard as it is. So I seen, and I did it myself as well, like, um, the plant and this incredible... Uh, teachings and incredible realms that we can get through uh, working with the medicines can also take us out of the body. And there is many people that, uh, including myself at the beginning especially, uh, that uh, find this fascination with the outside, the beautiful realms, sometimes beautiful, sometimes horrible, but uh, kind of like disconnect to the wisdom of the body and uh, I, I I done it so many times like okay drink more drink more like I have to move this energy okay I don't like this blockage and gotta heal my dad I gotta heal my mom I gotta heal this and that and uh, it comes become this eternal loop of healing that is actually preventing from being preventing from being, and being happens in the body. Being being happens when we are aware and we bridge, you know, in the yoga with the mind and the body are in the same place. So uh, what I'm doing now, and I, it is, and I've seen it also like an emphasis more in this integration, is um, practices, like meditation practice is a presence embodiment practice yoga practice, movement, how can I be, how can I feel my body, and also like taking um, quite a while, like have a ceremony and take time for this ceremony to sink, take time uh, for these teachings to be fully seen, to be fully understood. <coughs> Sorry, my voice dry. I feel like um, right now for me is a lot about not too much medicine because I I come from a time of like holding retreats, doing like always like drinking a little bit of medicine, always like having years of like five six retreats, seven ceremonies, six ceremonies, and uh, traveling so much uh, that I didn't have a home, a ground, and that was detrimental. So now I'm like, whew, <laughs> ceremony, beautiful, but how? what am I doing in the day-to-day -day basis? How are my relationships? Am I waking up early? Am I sleeping over? Nothing bad about that, but how do I want to live the day-by-day? 
is this day by day reflecting um, what I would like for my life, what the teachings of the plants have brought me to, and uh, how is my mind going. It's so like I, I use a lot of meditation because I'm a fan. Uh, um, exercise, not as much lately, but yoga. Um, communion with people, having like a normal life, being aware of how I relate to people and just uh, connecting to what is my intentions in life. And I feel like uh, plant medicine is so incredible to clear, stock energy, support us in healing, allow us to, to bring forgiveness, to move forward, to kind of like uh, become more present. Because when we have ties to traumas, it's like a part of our consciousness is still there. So what plant medicine is like, okay, let's clear this out so you can be here. And uh, honoring, as you said, plant medicine is being here. And uh, yeah, for me, it's just like, how can I, how can I be better? Or how can I be just here in a way that is authentic to my heart, in a way that is authentic to, to my spirit, in a way that I can generate uh, more goodness in this world? I don't know if that counts as practice, <laughs> but yeah, sure. yeah. So where do you where do you see this intersection with with Buddhism and plant medicine? Um, because there, I think for a lot of people, they're seemingly very very different paths. When when I started doing this work, one of the interesting things that I really noticed when I was teaching and then facilitating is often some of the more difficult cases that I saw. Uh, and at the same time, credit to these people, um, but uh, they were often Buddhist practitioners, um, and credit to them meaning that they actually came and, and, and worked with plant medicine, because I, I think for a lot of people, that's still to this day, although I think less and less, seen as something that's very counterindicated to Buddhism, like working with, with a plant is like, it's a big no-no, it's seen as... I'm going outside of not only the tradition, but like outside of what they see are these core teachings of Buddhism as I'm reaching or I'm grasping for something that's outside of myself where everything that I need is inside of myself. And, and I think in an ultimate level that's true, um, but at the same time, you know, I think it's been said, like if you have a tool, use it, um, because all of these things are tools in a way. But But what I saw from a lot of those people was, you know, interestingly, you were talking about embodiment, but what I saw was almost inevitably those people were also very much attached to their mind, to how they viewed Buddhism, which was coming from a certain worldview, from grasping at certain things, from, from living very strict in a way of, of what they believed was true and what was not true. And it wasn't coming from a place of openness, but it was coming from a place of, of rigidity. And, you know, I, I think, again, part of that is a worldview. Like you were speaking in the beginning, like this idea of separation is an illusion. And I think one of the things that really drew me to these practices, because even when I started, like when, when we met, I mean, I was working in a plant medicine center, but I was teaching meditation and martial arts and yoga. And for me, those things were never separate. Like they were always, I was always looking for the thing that connected all of them. Because for me, I saw truth in all of them. And, you know, maybe to my own detriment as well. But um, but that's that's always what interested me was that, that commonality. Like what can I take from all of these things that are pointing to, to, to a truth? And, uh, you know, even today, like now, I think there's a number of books and, and a lot of people may disagree with the premise, but that even in Buddhism, they were also working with plants. Um, you know, also I practice martial arts and, and, you know, I think it's another one of those things where, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot of resistance when I was teaching martial arts because it was seen as something that was not compatible with plant medicine even though the Shipibo, who we were working with, one of their main practices was also martial arts. They were wrestlers, they were fighters, they, they, that was their, their, their 
tradition was, was wrestling men with men, women with women, even, you know, fighting each other with knives to cut the back of the neck. I mean, it was, it was very much an embodied uh, practice as well. And, and, and even that idea of martial arts, I mean, it was, from most accounts, it was started by Indian or Chinese monks, religious people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you, you know, in that way, you know, for me, I saw that all of these things were connected. And, and even, you know, the traditional healers of, of Tibet, of China, of India, I mean, even though they were, they were monks or, or practicing spirituality, one of their main practices was also herbalism, working with plants, this idea that things weren't separate, that that, that integrative aspect of healing meant working with, with what you had, working with all of these things because they were all tools, they were part of that healing. And I think even when you look at, for example, Tibetan Buddhism, I mean, it's very shamanic. I mean, it's shamanic. very difficult to argue with that. I mean, if you're working with ayahuasca and you're looking at some of those Buddhist images, I mean, it's all about different spirits, different gods, different archetypes, different ideas of different realms, of lower realms, of middle realms, of upper realms, of of going through these different states of samsara, of, of going into different aspects of the mind, of fear, of doubt, of longing, of grasping, but, but very visually uh, pointing towards something. And, and and, you know, I think we even see that now in, 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 in other religions. Like, I think people are more maybe familiar now that even in, in Vedic religions, which is where, you know, Hinduism came from, there was this idea of working with Soma or in Zoroastrianism, working with Halma. Um, there's a lot of now research into early Christianity that very likely they were also working with very strong plants as well. So, you know, my sense is as time goes on, these kind of separations are beginning to dissolve. Um, you know, much like in, in martial arts, which I often use the example, is uh, it was very similar. There was Kung Fu, and there was Tai Chi, and there was Jiu Jitsu, and there was Judo, and there was boxing and wrestling. and They were seen as something very different. Um, but really what's emerging is now what's called mixed martial arts, meaning like how do you draw on the truth, on the beauty of all of them, and not see them as, as, as separate? Because when they were seen as separate, what was shown very clearly is they all fail. <laughs> they all fail. Um, because you're, you're accepting certain things and then not accepting other things, and so you're at a disadvantage. And I think even in, in, in like the shamanic path, it's very similar in that you know, traditionally... The good shaman would go to another tribe to learn their medicine yes. because it was seen that other tribes also had medicine. And, and how do you incorporate that? How do you learn that? So again, kind of a big question, but I think for, you know, actually it's quite simple, but that, that idea of, you know, for so many people, I think those ideas of Buddhism and plant medicine are seen as something very, very different, like almost not compatible. And so can you kind of speak about, about from, from your experience, from, from working with these, like how are they compatible? How do they, how do they join? How, do you, how can you have a, a foot in both worlds and, and, and bring them together? Well, the idea, it's interesting that you touch into this separation and in the roots of uh, many traditions, there is this, um, there's always been, uh, connection to plants and altered states of consciousness. It's always, as humans, we, there is a drone for being in a different type of consciousness. And that is kind of like the root of a, a, like meditation practice or Buddhist practices is coming from this entangled state of consciousness of like being over-focused on the mind and the thoughts to uh, awareness of what is present, just like separating from being in this turmoil of being caught in emotions and thought patterns into connecting to the one that sees, to the wise one that sees. And these stages I found a lot in plant medicine. Uh, one of the plants that I like to work with now a lot is um, Wachuma. And the name of Wachuma in Quechua means cut in the head which means like beyond this uh, understanding of life, understanding of the world, uh, lies this understanding that is um, 
I embody it, understand it. So you cut the head, no more thoughts. What do you feel? The heart, you feel your body more. So, yeah, in my own experience, the connection to Buddhist practices, as I said at the beginning, is like this map and this road into a different way of relating to life and relating to one another. And sometimes that road is not clear mark with shamanic practices. It's more about taking the medicine, uh, understanding oneself, and then what? Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 let me think how, the, how I think this, uh, how do I respond to the question. Can we elaborate it more? I mean, basically just uh, what is that dance between Buddhism and plant medicine? Like, w- how do you see those two walking together? Because again, I think for a lot of people, they're very separate paths. Like Buddhism means sitting in a lotus position, <laughs> meditating, renunciating things, living a more austere life, not identifying with thoughts. For a lot of people, plant medicine is not religious at all. It, it's anti-religious. You know, much as I said, some of the Buddhist people were not so compatible with plant medicine. A lot of times, plant medicine people are not so compatible with religion because they have their own ideas of religion. It's so interesting because I've been working in these Buddhist retreats for years. So all the people that come to us are Buddhist practitioners. And I have, like, served medicine to lamas few la- Buddhist lamas, and <laughs> this uh, wanting to, or this like, um, yeah, this attraction for something that is different from this reality, I think that both uh, traditions have. Like, what is beyond this day-by-day experience? One, uh, the Buddhist practice, you reach the states, you can reach very deep states, that are similar to the states that are rich with ayahuasca. However, ayahuasca is just much faster, much, much faster, much faster. Much faster. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <my laughs> We're talking a lot today. So I, with ayahuasca, you can reach this state. In Buddhist practices, to achieve this state will take a long time. It will take months of solitude, um, which has a benefit because you are walking in with uh, ayahuasca where other plant medicines, you are like on a road, on a rocket. So when, while you are doing this in a small, like really minute by minute awareness and uh, reaching these other states of being, of consciousness, and becoming aware of these states of consciousness, uh, there is a lot of clarity that arises. While when you are... Um, reaching these states of consciousness super fast, it could be confusing. It could be very confusing. And I feel like, uh, in my case, coming from, uh, first from plant medicine and then to uh, meditation practices was um, a way of understanding plant medicine much uh, better because it was slower, because it was more embodied, it was less believing in the head. Um, I feel that in the roots of uh, Buddhist practices, this connection, there is always like this curiosity for different ways, for curiosity for consciousness. How are we seeing? It's always like connecting back to what is consciousness. And... uh, Many teachers, many, many teachers, especially Western teachers back in the 70s, they were using um, psychedelics. They were using a lot of psychedelics before or during or after they engaged in these uh, practices like Ramdas, like even Jack Cornfield. He had a state in his life where he was using peyote. Joan Halifax, who is um, a Zen master, 
all these teachers, they all were attracted to uh, both paths at the same time, or one was the door to the other part, because there was this inquiry in consciousness. And uh, this is how I like to work uh, personally with plant medicines. Uh, I always go back into what, who is the one that is experiencing this. Giant revelations, visions, all this. Who is the one that is experiences? I have worked a lot with the DMT as well, smoking DMT, which is so fast. Who is the one that is experiences? And uh, for me, it uh, kind of allows me, the when I work in that way with plant medicine, it allows me to connect to this aspect of myself that is consciousness itself. It's just like, oh, and kind of like try to identify myself with consciousness. So that's how I practice when I drink medicine. Also like um, meditation is deeply healing because we are, f and plant medicine is deeply healing. When you are going to a long meditation retreat, you are sitting there observing yourself. At some point, all the things that you are running away from, because we are experts in running away from our traumas, our problems, uh, the things that we don't want to see. We distract ourselves all the time in our regular life. But when you are sitting there, you are forced to see your life all the memories of things that happens inevitably inevitably will come. And what is what is required is that you see, observe, and through these observations, um, the energy of the memory, the place where it is locked, that uh, trauma, that emotion, that energy, start opening up, it starts changing, it starts shifting, and we become more uh, conscious and we become more um, attuned and also like we become familiar with our parts of ourselves that have been left out. And it's exactly the same that happens with ayahuasca. Much faster though in like slow motions with meditation and it could be like full on like uh, when you go deep into a meditation retreat all these energies it could be like as intense as like an intense ceremony however with ayahuasca is faster you go you remember you have the vision of the memory you purge the trauma with meditation it's like it's slow and I see these two complementing pretty well because um uh, yeah, in my personal experience, I have had so much healing with ayahuasca, but uh, it wasn't. I didn't. It was so fast that it didn't allow me to just like repair. Didn't allow me to go into uh, perhaps ayahuasca was taking or and ayahuasca and wachuma as well. I love wachuma. Um, they were taking these big energies out of my system, but the residue is still there, and the residue of this that manifest as like subtle sadness or subtle, um, uh, I don't know, like some like emotions that are in the background and is still there. The moment that I pay attention to it, then I kind of like recover or like re become whole. Like this awareness help us to become whole and it's the same awareness that is required to be in a process of healing with plant medicine because we are not when we go there to there we are there to face our shadows we are there to care for the shadows it's, it's pretty much the same process does that make sense mm -hmm. <laughs> do you find similarities in these worldviews because often for example, in a more traditional, maybe shamanic or plant medicine worldview, uh, they're speaking about things like like spirits, about different realms of, of dimensionality, um, uh, about facing demons, about facing heavy energies, about connecting with, with the light or God. 
and and in Buddhism, you, you you can I don't know maybe you have similar things of, of again these, yeah, these sure. realms of samsara of of facing these kind of demonic forces or uh, becoming detached. I mean even the idea of the Buddha, someone who's surpassed this, that's also a very common archetype in in a, a more traditional shamanic lineage. Like for the Shipibo, the idea of the Maraya, the the one who's no longer attached to his or her body, they can be a jaguar, they can be an eagle, they can see things from different perspectives because they also are those things. Their consciousness isn't bound to a particular body. They've, they've, they've broken down the walls of the house. They've, they, they've been allowed to, uh, to see things from a different perspective. So do you, do you find there's, there's commonalities in those worldviews? You are saying the commonalities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. Like, um, I remember once we were working with the Shipibo shaman and a person as, you know, just like similar to what happened to you, but it was in a group. So he was asking um, something in these lights of like, I felt like I was attacked by this energy and this thing attacked me. And uh, what is that that is attacking me? And it was like beautiful. I think that you remember uh, Diogenes was mm-hmm. super sweet. So Diogenes like stopped and he said, is this something out there? The person was like, is something out there to get me and attack me? And Diogenes quietly said, see, it's like, it's your own mind. Which is really interesting because uh, all, we could, we could call it like spirits, we could call it oh, mental states. There is no what is in, what is out. It's like, it could be like somebody's energy that latches into your energy field because it was, there's a resonance in that. Or it could be your own mind's projection. It's like a really hard to pinpoint and be like, this is the right way or this is the wrong way to see it. It's just, I think, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to put words into something that is very hard to put words and um, in, I, I follow uh, Theravada Buddhism, which is the kind of like the old Buddhism, and it's more practice in Thailand, in Myanmar, and uh, it seems to be more logical. However, this was kind of um, they had since the roots, the shamanic and spiritual way of seeing life. And in the Buddhist practices, there's the same. There is like realms, realm of consciousness, the hungry ghosts. It's this type of consciousness that we have when there is nothing, this greed that is so big that nothing can satisfy us. And we could see that. It doesn't uh, have to be a realm like somewhere in a different world it's actually right here and it's actually a type of consciousness so um, I think like both are pointing into the same directions it's like these uh, places but these places are part of our consciousness as part of our reality in the world and they are manifested as well I I remember being in Thailand, and in Thailand they had these little houses, and it's like a Buddhist country, but they have these little little houses that they make and they put in the entrance of the house for the spirits, so they feed the spirits, and uh, I, I was told about this book, I will tell you at some point, which talks about the history of Theravada Buddhism and how Western people kind of like got more interested in it and uh, took out the more like folkloric spiritual part of it to make it more logical and appealing. Uh, But there is is a lot of that magic component, this unknown component, which uh, also is part of uh, shamanic practices. And if we think about like a Catholic, we would think about like angels, demons. There is also uh, an aspect of this spiritual world that we cannot see. However, is a type of consciousness. 
could be interpolated terms. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Yeah. So when, when you're running these retreats where you're working with, with plant medicine, I'll, I'll be at uh, ayahuasca or wachuma, and you're also working with these uh, Buddhist practices, how does that look like on a practical level? Like what's, how are you bridging those things? It's very practical for me because um, I work with subjects that can be, yeah, that everybody can understand. So I don't go into emptiness and there is nothing. Uh, I talk, I will talk, uh, we will meditate, we will connect to the body. We will um, kind of like invite people to bring awareness of their experiences and awareness of the body while they are in the state of the medicine. Okay, then uh, so because in the medicine you could dissociate. It's very easy to dissociate. And usually when people start screaming, all that, they are very far from their body. But there is another way of navigating these realms that is more present. So the um, invitation and encouragement is like, I could be far away, being, feeling, and I, at the same time, I could also be feeling my heart. And that makes it, um, yeah, sometimes it's not possible when it's like a full ceremony, but that uh, embodiment gives you uh, access to the wisdom of the body through the through the ceremony so there is always an invitation to embodiment there is always an invitation to when there is times where big emotions are happening sometimes people don't even know what is going on okay what are you feeling Okay, is sadness. Okay, how does that feel in your body? Okay, it feels here. Bring the heart, the hand into your heart. And that unravels and allows a healing to happen. Actually, this like deep connection to the body, somatic experience, allowed a healing and allows these energies to be moved a, like easily more consciously, with more care, with more compassion. There's also a lot of emphasis in compassion practices, emphasis in forgiveness practices, and bringing these subjects into uh, the mind. Just like a tiny old uh, Dharma talk into what means to be compassionate, what means to uh, forgive. And... Um, yeah, I like to talk about interconnected of all beings. I like to talk about uh, the four noble truths. You know, I will talk a different uh, subjects, but in a way that can be... Because those teachings are like... We could, when we talk about the Four Noble Truths and we talk about, which is like the classic basic teachings of the Buddha, we talk about there is suffering. It's not that you did something wrong. It's not that uh, it's unconsciousness cause suffering, and we suffer. So that brings, like, bringing awareness into these teachings could also be a supportive way for people to understand their own life and their own reality. And, uh, yeah, the way I'm doing this is meditation, emphasis in meditation, emphasis in embodiment, and in emphasis in certain core teachings that can be translated and can be um, supporting to the healing of the person. Also, they can bring the mind into a different state. Something I love a lot about uh, the Buddha's teachings is like uh, Bodhicitta, which is part of um, Mahayana more than Theravada, which is like uh, other kind of like ramification of the Buddhist, but the bodhicitta means this, um, the consciousness of the awakened being. So if you were Jesus or the Buddha or like an awakened being, what, were they, what would they be thinking of? And they would be thinking of supporting everybody because they know that there is a deep interconnection with every being. So like planting that seeds of, Instead of like me, 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 my healing, my... It's like, oh, let's plant the seed that our healing is for our families, for our country, for our ancestors. Like, and 
that at a practical uh, level, like a Buddhist level, it breaks a little bit this attachment to um, the solid self and this attachment to the ego and separate self. And it starts creating this awareness that we actually not separate, that we are part of this great um, wave of life and, uh, that includes our parents and ancestors, the spirit world, the plants and everything. So when we start like kind of like tossing these sweet uh, teachings, it just supports, supports us so we can see the world in a different way and become less mm, less uh, individual and more together and I also have a purpose of doing this work I feel like um, it's really hard to do this type of work if you are doing it just for yourself it's really hard to just find the motivations uh, and uh, the Buddhist path with emphasis in healing and awakening and a compassion and these practices just like open the heart so we can go through the healing and it's a little easier do you find for example when you're I mean I would imagine obviously all of the people are coming are, are very open to, to both of these paths as well when you're when you're working with someone maybe who who's worked with plant medicine and then you're giving them these these Buddhist tools or practices, do you do you find it's it's helping them to better understand their experience of working with plants? Uh, and maybe conversely in the same way, like you said, you were giving plant medicine like ayahuasca to llamas. Do you, in, in that sense, do you do you find the plant medicine is helping them to 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 already see what they've seen or understood in a different way, or it's also, in a way, giving them a different way of looking as well, or, or is it some combination of, of both? Definitely, like some combination of both, and uh, the states that we one can reach with plant medicine with different substances are very hard to reach if you don't have like a full-on constant practice and you go into retreat for many months. So one thing that I did, uh, this is like in my personal experience, I went to a very long retreat, and after that very long retreat, I had LSD, which uh, is not conventional medicine, but I feel like it's um, I, the respect that I have for that substance is very big for me. And I was able to see, like I was reading of all these teachings on... Uh, emptiness and you know these concepts that are really are concepts when you are reading it and they become a little more tangible when you have a little bit of practice but when you have this understanding in the mind then you have a substance and this understanding comes from like our logical and we are trying to understand but then this substance that is so powerful comes and you have the seed planted on this it's just like it's like a, a way of uh, connecting to these teachings in a more tangible form. And I've seen that uh, yeah, many times with uh, Buddhist practitioners that uh, yeah, they, they practice because it's hard to start with a practice unless you're a monk and you're meditating a long time. In this world, it's really hard to go into, to reach these levels. And at some point, people reach a plateau but at the beginning, because they came from zero to nothing, from zero to like a regular practice or like a 10-day retreat, there's so many insights and a lot of healing. But at some point, it's, uh, I have witnessed that it reached a plateau. And um, these plant medicines could just ignite. Uh, and it could also like uh, show more clearly uh, realms of consciousness and untied knots that were that would have taken a long time to tie with a, with a, with just practice and 
many it's not for everybody though it's, I have to say it it's not plant medicine it's not for everybody I long retreat is not for everybody mindfulness is for everybody <laughs> yeah more conscious is for everybody but uh, yeah I think like they complement in the way that I see it uh, there is a um, one of the precepts in the Buddhist tradition that uh, talks about intoxicants and uh, when it was written it was referring to like an alcoholic drink but um, now it's like extrapolated to every single thing that can uh, be intoxicant so some people think like the plant medicine is an intoxicant but uh, the reason of this um, precept is about you drink alcohol then you are not completely aware and therefore you break these other precepts you start acting harm, harmful for people so it's not about the drinking itself it's what it does to your consciousness so you uh, harm others and yourself and with plant medicine plant medicine can be a beautiful tool to make us more aware and to heal so and also like to bring more clarity about our lives and about our paths and our uh, future and what is important for us so it actually doesn't cloud the mind could cloud the mind you you, you said um, in your view plant medicine isn't for everyone who who do you think uh, plant medicine is is not for there has to be a deep calling to it. it cannot be something that somebody's pushing you to it never works like that and uh, people with certain mental conditions uh, pathologies schizophrenia uh, bipolar disorders it could exacerbate their conditions so it has to be taken with a lot of responsibility because it is such a strong substance, ayahuasca, wachuma. Especially I'm talking about ayahuasca because it's the one that they have more experience with and it's the one that uh, has become more um, famous. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's substances that have to be taken with a lot of care and a lot of respect and a lot of intention and uh, with cautious because mental sometimes we have uh, our minds could be fragile and people that are going perhaps like people that are going through so much uh, they need to be grounded before taking these substances I would not advise somebody that is going through a full on like full on separation death or something that is already stabilizing to at that moment to take plant medicine because it could be even more destabilizing so it, it requires uh, a strain of body and mind to be uh, engaging with the plant medicine mm -hmm. so you, you, you mentioned Wachuma and um, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with that Wachuma San Pedro uh, what has that journey been like for you? Because you, you started with ayahuasca, now you're also living in an area where wachuma grows. How would you describe that plant medicine? And, and also maybe how do you find it different from your work with ayahuasca? I love wachuma. I'm like, you'd say the word wachuma, I'm like, yay. <laughs> it makes me very happy. It's a plant that resonates with my spirit uh, at this time more than ayahuasca. I feel like uh, ayahuasca, when it came to my life, it was a time for a lot of deep, deep healing and deep energetic movements and deep, uh, like trauma healing that require uh, medicine that was as strong as ayahuasca in the tradition that I was following, that was the Shipibo tradition, which is one of the uh, traditions that has a, let's say, a vibration as a focus into shadow work. So at that time, was uh, very needed. And uh, however, like, uh, I had Wachuma for years, years before now, and it always felt, um, I always had a deep love for this medicine. It's a medicine of presence. 
is a medicine that doesn't have the visions. It's a medicine that uh, could be visionary, but most it will be just like enhancing what we already see, uh, not like full-on visions as other medicines, or ayahuasca in particular. But uh, this quality of bringing oneself to the body, this quality to cutting the cut in the head, cut in the thought process and allowing me and allowing us to be uh, in contact to a uh, deeper wisdom that comes from this connection of the heart, this connection to full, I talk a lot about empowerment by the way, for this connection of full um, other way of living, the embodied way of living, something that I appreciate from Wachuma a lot. It's, I found it less confusing than ayahuasca because of the fact that it's um, less visionary and it's more embodied. I find uh, Wachuma is a plant that connects us to the heart. Everybody will say that. It's like, uh, as um, I could see, I can uh, see, I see it like this. Like ayahuasca, there's a big component of like root chakra, uh, healing through this like. Um, more like root chakra, like lower chakras, ancestor healing. But from that point of view, uh, Wachuma is the same healing. You could heal your ancestors, but with a more open heart, with this ability to uh, create this understanding and create this healing through this awareness of uh, that we can have when we have an open heart. And that goes uh, very well with me. Also... I love uh, the earthiness. There is a. Mm, I think it's because I am from the Andes in Ecuador. I plant a lot of wachuma in my house. I plant a lot of wachuma as well. But there is a. Yeah, like a groundness that we have with ayahuasca, with wachuma. Also, with wachuma, the journeys are long. And because the journeys are long, um, the integration can happen in the same journey. It's not like in good ayahuasca could be like a stretch, incredible, powerful, but like four hours of like, whoa. <laughs> but with Wachuma, you're like a little bit slow. It's like, it could be intense at the times and then you go down a little bit. And this allows for the body to also uh, move in that rhythm, for the consciousness and understanding to move in that longer rhythm of ceremony I with ayahuasca I think it's, I know it's not the same for everybody but for a lot of people and certainly for me uh, it would be in the mud I could not move I wouldn't feel uh, at least at the beginning uh, perhaps at the end of ceremony yeah, this rush of energy and beautiful presence but with Wachuma the um, this energy of the sun, this energy has a, like a masculine, let's say, it's like yang plan, like strong. So this is strain, this chi is very present. So I have deep reverence for both, both plan medicine, but I feel like this time in my life, uh, Wachuma is the one that is calling me. And uh, also like uh, I work with mushrooms as well. Uh, but at this time, after I learned so much with ayahuasca, uh, I felt this pull to learning from Wachuma. So, w what is your work now? You you also do retreats with Wachuma, with with mushrooms as well. You you integrate Buddhist practices into those. Yeah, I always integrate in Buddhist like meditation uh, into all my life. I have a few little things that I'm doing. One of them is uh, retreats, uh, it's called Pachanui Retreats. Pachanui is the Latin name of Wachuma. So it, I started last year and uh, we work with, uh, it's in a format, 10-day format retreat, and we have three ceremonies, which by the way is like a lot because it's a whole 24-hour ceremony. And uh, kind of like the pillars of uh, the retreat is this work with Wachuma, the plant medicine. Uh, we also incorporate meditation, um, yoga practices. Uh, I don't know, uh, do you remember Uli? 
Oh, I think I have to show you. Yeah, yeah. from now, Vienna. Now you mention, yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. I work with him, mm-hmm. like a twenty-five years plus yogi. Uh, so it's really beautiful to have that person that brings the emphasis in the body during the retreat, and we also connect to the indigenous traditions from here. From here, during the retreat, we go. Uh, to different uh, powerful places because there is so much energy, so much magic here in these mountains, in this land. So, well, those are the retreats that I started last year. And today, to this year, we have two retreats in July and uh, October. So there's one part. Uh, the other part that I am creating is uh, a wellness center here in Pisac that it's going to be open on two weeks and it's, um, yeah, that is very exciting for me because uh, it comes from this uh, deep, like, uh, this deep wanting for myself, <laughs> this wanting of, like, uh, be strong in my body, be in, be in my body, take care of my body, take care of my mind, take care of... Because, as I was saying, like, uh, these practices could be very mental, and people go into the retreat and barely moves. So it's, there's something that, uh, for me, is not, like, balanced there. Um, and I find that uh, uh, by creating a space that welcomes people, that uh, is uh, focusing diversity, we have a lot of diversity here, mestizo people, indigenous people, foreign people, and it uh, has and works with, like, martial arts I would love that or like we have machines we have like personal trainers and classes in nutrition classes in physiotherapy how to take care of the body I, I had a crazy surgery in my knees years ago and I have to be in bed for nine months or like learn how to walk again for a long time it took me nine months to walk back so I have this uh different approach and different view of my body now. So I have created this uh, wellness center. It's called Vida Wellness Center. That is another project. I also have a class in, uh, in the Secret Valley in Pisac called uh, Plant Medicine, Secret Plant Medicine and the Buddha's Teachings. And I would love you to come. Uh, we talk about different teachings and uh, for example, la- last class is on Fridays. Last class was um, on uh, a non clinging, no attachment, letting go, and how that, uh, what is the teaching of the Buddha regarding that, what is our experience uh, regarding that, and how that's manifest in ceremony or in, in the teachings of the plants. So it's kind of like a, this. Um, because this is very new, this like merge of this kind of like trying to see or find the commonalities between these two practices is something pretty new. So we just uh, discuss and we just try to get the wisdom of every participant and see what is our experience. And this is a very dear, dear class to me. Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Those are, those are all my projects. Beautiful. Is there anything we we didn't touch on that you'd like to, to talk about before we wrap up? I, no, I don't think so. I think like, uh, we had a beautiful conversation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. It, it was a pleasure to to reconnect. It's been a long time, and I think a long time in the making, and you're, you're a lovely person, and I, I think you're doing beautiful work, and um, if, if people are interested to, to reach out to you, what's the what's the best way to, to do that? Through your website? Yeah, that will be the best way. Yeah, and there is another way website that I will be creating. I'm not the most technological person. It's like, oh, <laughs> I have to, but yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that will be the best way. Well, beautiful. I, I really wish you all the best, and I'd, I'd love to mm-hmm. come and participate anytime, uh, anytime you'd like. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. And thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for inviting me. Mm-hmm. Such yeah. a pleasure. All right, everyone. That's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jeanette. Uh, it was really a pleasure for me uh, to sit down and 
talk with her, um, and also, as always, learn a bit more about her background. Uh, sometimes even these people we're close with, we don't know uh, everything about them. So uh, I hope you found that interesting, those those topics of her work with plants, the intersectionality of Buddhism. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting topic. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Also, those tiers give you some uh, added benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. To all the people who are doing that, as always, thank you very much for the support. I, I really appreciate it. And if you're able to, uh, that's really what helps uh, to allow me to continue with this podcast and bringing on these guests. Um, if you're not able to do that, as always, doing some of the small things to help with the algorithms. So if you're viewing this on YouTube or Rumble, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, all of those things really help to drive the algorithms. And then with the audio versions on YouTube, uh, sorry, on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, uh, leaving a starred rating and a short review. Um, my upcoming guests, um, I have a woman coming on to speak more deeply about the Celtic traditions and uh, kind of the Celtic uh, worldview, mythology. Uh, she wrote a, a really beautiful book uh, and, and also about uh, uh, plants and trees. Um, and then after that, uh, I'm still not sure. I, uh, I'm actually leaving for a trip soon, so I'm trying to organize who will come on and the schedule and everything. Um, but as always, I hope to bring on some really fascinating guests. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope this finds you all well, and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank you.